Hello and welcome to Samvad's public interactive conversation Tete Tete. My name is Mesma Belseri and I'm the co-founder of Samvad, an artist-run organization that was created specifically to allow conversations on topics that pertain to the Indian classical performing arts of music and dance. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel or liked us on Facebook, please do so now. Without any further ado, I welcome moderator Sapna Govindan today, who will be speaking with two speakers, dancers, on the topic presenting traditional dance forms on a global stage. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you'll continue to attend Samvad's events online. Sapna? Hi, thank you, Mesma. Change is an incontestable fact of life. So it is in the world of art. The traditional dance forms of India have traveled beyond the regional and national boundaries and are consistently presented on the global stage. Practitioners also come from beyond the traditional communities of origin and sometimes from very different cultural backgrounds. This transition brings with it certain challenges for both the performers and the audience. How do artists navigate these challenges? I hope to draw upon the experiences of our speakers in trying to find answers to some of these questions. Today, I joined Dr. Mehtal Devika, an acclaimed Mohiniyattam dancer, choreographer, and researcher based in Kerala, India, and Dr. Elena Catalano, a well-known Odissi dancer, educator, and cultural anthropologist based in London. I invite our viewers to read more about our speakers in the descriptions on the YouTube channel you're watching. I would also request to keep your questions concise and to the point as we are reading them in real time. Devika and Elena, welcome. If you could start your video and unmute yourself. Devika. Devika, so your chosen field of performance has been the form of Mohini Atta. As a practitioner of a form that has evolved within your own culture and as a performer, who has taken it beyond the immediate cultural environment that you are in. Could you speak to us a bit on what has informed that process? Uh, thank you, Sapna, and uh, hello, Elena, and hello, all viewers. Um, a lot of things, actually, I have a different strategy for <laughs> different things, and because the options now are really, really uh, so many, and uh, uh, for me personally, when I when we talk about taking traditional dance to a global platform, uh, it isn't really necessary that you need to, uh, you know, follow an absolute uh, distinctive pattern or make it black, black or white. I still think you can stick within the parameters of the form, because if there are expectations when you do that, uh, then again you're drawing boundaries and you're engaging the the artist and the art form. And uh, you were also talking about my immediate cultural environment, which is which is pretty global themselves because they are the home community, home viewers, but I must say they're extremely sensitized to Mohini Atom and also many other art forms. And uh, especially with their prolonged viewing of art forms like, uh, you know, Pudi Atom and other uh, their aesthetic sensibilities about Mohini Atom are really, really high. They're very receptive 
uh, with change, uh, but they can be very unforgiving about uh, bad dancing and bad craft in the name of change. And I have always always seen that even when they view a Bharatanatyam uh, you know, concert that's maybe tweaked a little in content for a global audience, they say, uh, you know, and then they give utmost importance to the craft, finally. <laughs> so for me, I personally, I would look at a lot of variables. Perhaps I would ask uh, what kind of audience is going to view me? Uh, what are the, the, you know, the demographic profile if I can get? If they, were, if they are practitioners of Indian classical dance or any other form, uh, if, uh, if they are an Indian community or a community of other nationals, are they specific to a particular region or is my dance going virtual where even my home community is going to be, going to be seeing? Mm -hmm. Then the art form becomes, then it becomes very dicey because you have a community. Yeah, are you going to say something? Yes, uh, there's a feedback from the audience that you could maybe speak closer to the mic. All right, all right. So thank is it better thank now? You. Yeah, thank you so much. So, um, uh, so when you have, uh, when you're performing, uh, you know, to a global audience and you have your local, your home community also watching you, then the challenges, uh, you know, it's, it's really, really scary because they're used to seeing uh, you and your corpus and uh, how, how would they embrace you when you're going to make changes? And do you really need to make changes? I, I would ideally look at uh, my art form uh, in such a way that do I really want to portray Mohiniyattam? Has my audience seen me before previously? Uh, if they have not, I wouldn't do anything, you know, that would seem overtly strange for them. Uh, and uh, I would work within, uh, you know, within the parameters of my form. I would perhaps extend, try extending, <laughs> uh, you know, the creativity there. And, uh, and I, I, feel, I would feel very confident sticking to my skill set and sticking to my strengths rather than doing something um, that I'm not very confident about in the first place. Uh, and even if it's taking uh, a re-narration, whether it's revised narration or whether it is a repeated narration, uh, I would say that uh, if your dance isn't good, then you're not going to be forgiven. So, you know, if, if you've pleased, uh, you can't please everybody, but if you've pleased 60 PC of the audience, at least, I'm, I'm sure we are good to go. So, I mean, that's what I feel about taking your art form globally. I don't think it's much of a, it's not much of a difference, but uh, for me personally, I work on minimalism. Uh, I find that it is so difficult to be simple these days. And uh, I, I work on, um, on, on ex not explicitly vocalizing what I feel. My mental narrative will be very different, but what I perform will be as simple and minimalistic as possible because I feel that is a challenge that uh, is very unique to Mohiniyattu. Thank you, Devika. Elena. As someone coming from a different cultural background, you have had to delve deep into the culture that informs ODC. Also, you have a unique perspective of being in touch with very different cultural contexts. Could you give us a brief, brief introduction to your experiences based on that perspective? Yeah, thank you, Sapna. Thank you for inviting me to this conversation. So yes, as you said, um, I'm actually Italian. And uh, often people ask me, why Indian dance? Why do you do that? And it's a long story, but also it's a very brief story. I'll try to talk about that and see how that explains also the way we can uh, mediate and talk to global audiences, because we are at the same time the audience um, at some point in time. So um, I think my journey into dance is very interwoven with my journey in cultural anthropology. Um, so I've been always involved into dance and performance, uh, but then as I grew up, I became interested in understanding uh, human cultural diversity and what eventually make us all human. So this brought me, this was um, essentially um, kind of 
um, propelled by um, phenomena as migration, world music, the revival of folk dances, and the representation of different cultures in, in the film industry. So I became interested in understanding different cultures. Um, this brought me to study cultural anthropology. Um, so as I was studying also cultural anthropology, I was also deepening my studies of dance. Uh, but for me, always dance has been um, first and foremost, um, or in, at least initially, was an introduction, not an introduction, but a window into a cultural world. So the way I approached, approached the initially dance was to understand other people through the dance. I never thought initially I would be an artist or I would be even a dancer, um, although I've always been doing theatre or dance or gymnastic. Um, at the same time, this journey with dance um, has grown, has developed. Um, so gradually, this brought me uh, through studying different dance forms, such as African dance. I was in Africa also doing research. Um, and I mean, the idea behind that was that the body is um, a strong tool of uh, empathy and transcultural understanding. So. Um, what has brought me to dance really and going deep into dance is this understanding of how we can use the body to understand the other but also to understand ourselves and communicate with the others so eventually this long journey brought me to odyssey but when i reached odyssey i was very well conditioned to um, perceiving uh, cultural nuances because of having studied different forms and in parallel often in parallel um, and understanding how these different forms use the body and use the energy. So in a way it was quite, it was very easy for me to connect with Odyssey. Um, yeah, because it, re it really kind of resonated also something with me um, as well as I was ready to eat. So this is a bit my perspective in terms of um, approaching uh, dance and Odyssey from this anthropological perspective. This has changed through time, and I would like to make a point that things change. There is no really uh, one thing that is true throughout your journey as a human being, as an artist. Um, yeah, and the main point of change is that our interests shift. So um, initially you are learning the dance and you're really focusing on understanding the culture behind the dance, but then gradually as you grow, perhaps your interests shift. So I would like to stop here because maybe other ideas would come up. Continue. Thank you, Elena. Um, I look forward to hearing more about your experience and journey. Um, so I have tried to approach this discussion through a few broad questions. Uh, we will try to tease out final points if time allows. The last half hour will be dedicated to answering questions from the audience. Hope you bring us some tough questions. So, um, Devika, um, I, I plan to pose the question to both of you. I'll start with you. Um, like changes are inevitable, isn't it? When a form moves, for example, some of these traditional forms, even the ones with the longest performative history, when they have moved from temples or courts to proscenium stage, then to a very different cultural context or space, Change is inevitable. So also bodies that are shaped by a dif different cultural context coming in to perform these forms. In that case, how do you reconcile with those changes with the need to keep the core of a form intact? And by extension, what do you, how do you consider, which is, <laughs> it is a difficult question. How do you consider what is the core of a form uh, that is intimately linked with its identity. How would you go about? I'm sure like this is a question that occurs to a lot of artists. Mm. Uh, core of a form is very, if you, I would say there are two ways. If you internally, if you look at it in, in, in the Indian philosophies, we will say the core is the, is the Atma of every art form, but if you look at it physically, I would say uh, if an art form has to endure change 
and if it has to extend and be inclusive, then the core should be the grammar and the physical, like physicality of the art form itself. So which means even if the art form, uh, even if every classical dance or, or folklore is, uh, or it's, it's, it's an artifact basically, it has crystallized or frozen the human spirit or human behavior over different periods in history. So uh, it, it is entirely up to the dancer to maybe um, eliminate what she thinks would be okay to adapt what she thinks would be okay, or to, to redo or rework on elements that perfectly suit uh, him or her. So the, if, if you know the grammar itself and your grammar is sound, then it, it, it gives you a big canvas to work on it, irrespective of whether you know the history. So basically it's like learning a language. You don't need to know the French Revolution if you want to speak in French. So, uh, you know, you can even use cave art to visualize the Malayalam poetry. <laughs> so basically, uh, it's always the, the, the movement dynamic that I would say, which has really stayed. And, and definitely, uh, it, it also gives you access to different, to the roots also. It will give you access uh, uh, to the future also. So through physicality, you also uh, get to know uh, different facets of, of, of a culture where there may be certain areas that may interest you like native literature or native uh, songs or music, which you can probably adapt. But if you, want to, if you just want to work with the medium, you're fine. Uh, but if you want to work something uh, related uh, to the cultural context from which the medium originated, then you better know, um, you know, the basics too. So, and that's how, uh, that's what I feel. Yeah, shall I respond? Elena, would you like to? Yeah, I largely agree with Devika, absolutely. Um, one point, as you said, changes are inevitable. Changes are constantly happening as the dance move from body to body. From one year to the other, we change the way we dance because our body ages or changes. And the way a young person dances is different from an older person. So denying changes is political and is about essentialism, is about wanted perhaps to hold an identity, but is just denying the truth of life. Life is constantly changing. So now your question was, how do we reconcile these changes with the core of the essence? So there are, I guess there are two changes. One is, oh, two kinds of changes. One is organic uh, and one is more revolutionary. So organic is when you don't even pose the change as a problem, it just happens. You may acknowledge it as it happens, but it's not an issue. Revolutionary is when you, you actually want to change something and you may have any kind of motivation. It may be because you have pressure from your founders or your audience, they want to see something different, or maybe you are unsatisfied. You are unsatisfied with the content of the dance, uh, with certain values. You are unsatisfied with certain, even, even physical value. For instance, I'm just giving an example. You may have learned to do chalk, in my case, tribang in a certain way, but then by through your study, you realize that that way can be uh, dangerous maybe. And so you want to make a change. So, um, and in terms of content, it can be like some people are uneasy with certain um, stories or values and they want to make those changes. And then there are organic changes, as I said, which are more like fluid and they don't become an issue. They just happen. Um, so that said, um, I think uh, the core and the essence is difficult to pinpoint and it can change, as Devika said, according to the individual. But I think it kind of stays, the very, the very, like uh, the nut of that, the really core is a specificity of using the body uh, with a certain way of moving the energy in the body. Now that can change, can change on a long term quite, uh, quite dramatically. Uh, I'm thinking about this in the 50s or 60s. 
an Odyssey right now. Yes, it's always Odyssey, but it's so quite different in the way the dynamic and the energy is moved between in the dancer and between the dancer and the audience. So um, there is something that we still recognize as such, but there is so much change. Um, so how do you keep the core? Uh, by being rooted, I guess, I guess Devika also mentioned this word. Being rooted means knowing exactly where this is coming from, having solid foundation. And then from there, you move naturally, like water moves in the river, and it goes, it goes. It just passes through, through different you know, paths, and then it moves. Uh, but your roots, I, I believe your roots should be quite solid. Otherwise, that sense of the, the genetic, almost, of the dense form get lost even before exist. Um, yeah, so I think if you want to be true to that essence, you need to be soaked into it. Also, at the same time, I think we don't have to, um, how can I say, idealize this being soaked too much, because sometimes as young dancers, we are discouraged, because discouraged from creating or discouraged from making choices, because we believe, and rightly so, that we are not soaked enough. So mm. where do you put the line between feeling I am full enough of this and I can do a little step forward? I think that's a journey that every artist does. And there is a sense of confidence that comes uh, once you are clear about your values. So your personal values and what is important to you. And that is constantly changing throughout your life as an artist, as a human, you know, growing um, into it, growing in the art form and growing in your own body. Mm -hmm. so, I guess this is my answer to that question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Elena, to you, um, from a rather practical point of view regarding these thematic changes, as someone whose day-to-day -day practice and performance are positioned in a place that is culturally away from the form that you practice. So, um, where the performance opportunities might more geared towards more mainstream forms, for example, like modern or contemporary, how do you position your art? Well, does that involve these um, catering to a certain team when it comes to applying for grants or applying for dance festivals? And if that is so, would you, how would you go about it? because uh, some thematic expressions might even require stepping out of the movement vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, again, I think for me is about uh, accepting that this can shift through time as an artist. And it depends on the context, it depends on the audience, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, are you trying to get funding and what the funding are? And it's a fine line. And it's a mediation. A mediation means there is no black and white, and we are constantly changed. Even if, as we enter in conversation with other people, somehow our way of thinking changes, whether it's by uh, becoming more rigid or maybe becoming more open. So how do you go about? So I just wanted to say that for a long time, a little bit because of my cultural anthropology um, hat, I have acted as a cultural translator so my main goal was about explaining um, what I was doing and what that mean, um, meant in the context based on my understanding, obviously. But this is, I mean, a shift gradually. And now I feel stronger as an artist. I have to do that when it's the right context to do that. It's an educational context where maybe the programmer is aiming at letting the audience know about the story we are narrating, or they are explicitly requesting uh, maybe the, the traditional repertoire. Um, but in terms of, say, funding application, I am more interested in um, telling new stories or telling my stories. So I am navigating. I think the actual answer to that is it's not a, like a two-phase comment. I'm yeah. Um, it's a constant navigation in a very complex um, ocean of meanings and values. I think my, yeah, as an anthropology, I see all these shifting values. I see how, uh, say, in the British context, certain values that are 
like um, defined by contempor Western contemporary aesthetics sometimes are applied and I kind of react to this. And that's why I, I stick also to my form. Although I have learned many different forms, one reason is because I feel more confident and the other reason is because I believe it's so rich that I don't need to fuse it or with contemporary movement or with contemporary aesthetic making a very hard choice. I just find myself into it. Um, it's it's not it's not an easy path. It's, mm -hmm. it's a constant, constant shifting. Yeah, constant shifting. I think. Devika, do you have anything to add to that? So, I mean, I, what was your question? It was about how I navigate change. Yeah. So, if you have had, um, as someone who's performing for international audiences or some. International, on international dance festivals, have you had to deal with the fitting your performance into a certain theme that is provided to you? And if that is not immediately accessible to the traditional form that you are performing, have you, how do you navigate it? And does, how do you make that judgment call of maybe stepping out of the uh, traditional vocabulary that you've been? Uh, uh, no, I... Uh... I don't think I've had a I have had a problem. See, basically, whatever content they give us, or you know, whatever they demand of us, one thing is that I, I don't think everybody knows the nuances of Mohiniyat to, <laughs> to say, you know, to step out of it, <laughs> to ask you to step out of it. Mohiniyatam is an art form. I think when you see hundred uh, Bharatanatyams or hundred Odysseys, you would probably see only one. You see. I think uh, Devika's um, video is frozen. Can you hear me? Ah, oh, yeah, you, you were frozen for a little bit. All right, all right. You're so, back. so, yeah, thank God. So, <laughs> it, it's not like uh, uh, people are very acquainted with Mohiniyatam. And mm -hmm. within the rules itself, I feel there's a lot of uh, work that can be that can be done. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about content, ideally, uh, Indian classical dance, a good thing about Indian class classical dance tradition is the fact that it has very conveniently, uh, you know, uh, embraced itself or camouflaged itself with the concept of uh, the self in different ways, whether it's self-love or love for another person or whether it is tatwa masi or whether it is anything i mean it's 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 it could be even uh, uh, covered in the name of uh, different symbols or semiotics or even bhakti right so uh, it, to take content uh, from any any sphere of life is not very difficult because you find that the emotions are so universal everywhere and and even if you take the African, she was just talking about her. I was just reminded about the Ubuntu, which says, you know, I am because you are. And it again talks about human spirit in a very collective way. So definitely there isn't anything that we can't do in Indian classical dancing. It's just how you do it. Even if it's if it's very small, it's, it's just about how you do it. it. I don't think it's about, you need to... Uh, you know, have tall claims or you need to uh, change narratives much. But given a, a, point, a given a duration of time, uh, it, it really is based about based on how you would like. You can make it as it's it's like architecture. You can make it eclectic. You can make it contemporary. You can make it traditional. You can have fine lines. You can have wabi sabi. So uh, it's purely the discretion of the artist. And mm -hmm. I haven't had a problem. And even uh, if you if you talk about change in terms of even space, it's not just the uh, theater space. Like Elena was rightly saying, you actually give an introduction to what you're doing, and um, and in space now that we have the camera, also we have the virtual space. Uh, the, the possibilities are much more now. Now, are you going to document a work that's meant for? Is the camera used for documenting a work that's meant? for the stage or is a camera a part of movement too is a camera the a part of the performance too uh, so these are aspects that uh, we would have to uh, like she said rightly use navigate <laughs> uh, in the coming years yeah i mean very yeah. soon yeah the dance film is also a a, a topic of interest um 
So we'll move on to the next um, question, um, which is the audience. The audience also come from a different cultural context where they may not be familiar with certain nuances that go with the form that you are presenting. How do you approach that, uh, such a presentation uh, to an audience that who may not be familiar with the nuances of the form? You're Just asking me? Connecting, the, connecting with the audience. Yes, you can start. Uh, it's very simple. I think it's as simple as having uh, an audience within your own culture who can't connect with the art form. Hmm. <laughs> we have so many of them, actually. Uh, so you, you use the same approach. Uh, uh, we, Abhinava Gupta rightly talks about Sahridaya, right? You use the word Sahridaya. And um, Sahridaya is, uh, he's even way in the early 80s, he's spoken about the audience not coming with a preconceived notion. Uh, you know, uh, the audience being versatile themselves about doing the art. Um, and that's very interesting in the sense that mm. they need not really know, know the technique to completely understand or infer certain uh, subtleties that the art form really portrays. Now, for example, uh, in, now for a, as a Malayali, if I'm seeing a performance of Mohiniyatam in, in the language of Malayalam for the first time, I may probably not even listen to the lyrics, you know, I may probably not even get to the, uh, you know, core of the lyrics. What would please me is the form itself mm -hmm. uh, and how, how, you know, communicative it is or whatever. So, um, uh, I feel the audience has that great capacity and it is something that should be, that can be cultiv cultivated, it can be inherent. Right. Uh, so I don't think we should worry much about that. An audience here uh, is as, uh, as as grave as an audience out there or as as intense as an audience out there or is as uh, naive as an audience out there. So uh, basically you introduce your art form. Now, I'll give you another example. Uh, uh, I, I don't know much of Malayalam. I can speak. I can read. But if I were to enjoy a Malayalam uh, poem, uh, I'm sure I would enjoy it much more or infer it much more or get to the suggestive meaning of it much more than a person who knows Malayalam or the, all the words in the dictionary, you know? So, I mean, even if they know all the words there put in the poem, I'm sure the, the, the flavor of uh, getting into the suggestive quality of the poem is, mm. it just comes naturally. So I think you have to have uh, a thought process. You have to have a um, uh, very uh, you know, refined manner of thinking or uh, not a very definitive pattern. I guess you have to be more open. And I think it's this, it's not being um, defined. Uh, it's, it's, it's being not, not having limited identity that makes you a better person than not. Elena? Would you? Yeah, so my views again are quite similar in terms of thinking that the dance has to speak for itself. So if a dancer is strongly rooted in what she is doing and there is quality, I mean, you may want to explain, but um, the dance should speak for itself. If you see a painting, it's nice to go to look at the background of the painter, maybe to know a bit of the story, but ultimately, you have to connect with the painting. I mean, this thing of explaining, I, I, I am becoming uncomfortable with explaining our art forms, especially in the context of a performance. It is different for me if we are teaching or if the session is more about a lecture and if the session, the purpose of the session is to actually educate. I feel like performances should not just be about that, should be about um, the artist communicating something through the art form. So making choices, even if you are choosing a rep, rep material, how you are choosing the rep material. Are you just choosing it because you want to show your skills? That's perfectly fine, as long as you are clear. So that's the goal of your performance. Or are you selecting items that make a journey? Um, I think this connects a little bit with your previous question about how you select or how you respond to the teams, right? I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, so I do think that we, even when we present, generally I don't present the full rep repertoire, 
firstly because there is no request um very little requests and mm -hmm. for very few people who often are artists from india and they get big big stage uh, so when I present two, three items, the maximum I have performed perform maybe is 40, 45 minutes. Um, yeah, it's generally for an Indian or a, for an audience that is familiar with the Indian aesthetics. So it's quite different. So you can talk in a different way. Um, but yes, coming back, I wanted to say that in the context of a performance, um, we need to see ourselves not, not necessarily as cultural mediators, but as artists. So what is it that we want to tell the audience about our art? Do we want to explain them that this is based on chalk and Tribangi, or we want to tell them that there is a message, or maybe we want to tell them that this piece is about music, and to fully enjoy this piece, you need to absorb and let yourself um, soak in the music. I think my, my problem with all this is that we want to often patronize audience imagination. Uh, we want to kind of making sure that they have a correct interpretation. And I think that's kind of very restricted understanding of how a piece of art, because we do perform piece of art, hopefully at the good level or the upper level. Um, but how can actually give, can we give audience tools to open their imagination rather than close their imagination? This is my challenge, actually. What kind of words can I use? What kind of lines that say but don't say too much? Allow the audience to be emoted rather than understanding intellectually. So just to finish my response to this, I think this kind of obsession with explaining, it comes a little bit also from the audience itself, because um, most Western audiences actually at the, at the moment have a very conceptual approach to art and to dance. So they approach dance as understanding, but I do think that dance is a, needs to emote, first of all. So you as an audience, you may appreciate so many, so many things. You may appreciate the technique, you may be emoted, you may look at the, at the story, but yeah, I think as artists, we have this, the responsibility of making sure that we do not reduce our art form to intellectual understanding, but to a bodily transmitted physical experience. Um, that's my challenge, kind of the things I would like to achieve uh, with my own personal work. Um, yeah. So both of you seem to have similar views on that aspect. Um, I would um, request the audience to type their questions on the YouTube page and also keep the questions short and precise um, as we are reading them real time. There is one question from the audience. Um, so I will direct it to both of you. Is the move to virtual space an aspect of performance that you would like to retain once we exit the pandemic? Can you say that again, just to make sure we get it? Yes. Back? Is the move to a virtual space an aspect of performance that you would like to retain once we exit the pandemic? Nadevika, please. Of course. <laughs> All right. Would you like to elaborate on it? And lots of reasons because um, uh, the physical space is very different from the virtual space in terms of even performance space, not just the viewing space, but how you, uh, like I first said that it's not just the body that you're using in the virtual space, you're using a lot of other media. Uh, you're, you're, you're using light, you're using camera, you use, you can use, uh, you know, augmented, rea augmented reality, you can use virtual reality. There's a lot of, lot of things that you can do with, with space and time. And I would definitely, and if you have, particularly if you have themes that, uh, you know, are content which requires uh, a such, such an approach or requires the, uh, the accompaniment of those teachers, then you should do it because there are a lot of things that you can't probably do on stage, but you can do on, in a virtual mm -hmm. space or mm -hmm. not just virtual space, uh, uh, through a, a nicely videographed work, yeah. So uh, related to that, I have, oh, uh, Elena and Woody, what is your? Yeah, again, <laughs> I, 
agree um, and I, I just want to highlight a different point it's about the democrat democracy no democracy it's more democratic I think you'd say in terms of uh, people who normally will not have access whether because they are located in area that doesn't have you know it's not London mm -hmm. or New York people who live outside of those the centers they can still see a performance of so people who have small children and they cannot go and watch a performance and they they can watch it on the screen i think uh, we have been so lucky i mean in this year of pandemic i have watched performances from artists from india that i'm always craving to watch and can never watch me really. very true so i think um it's very important that we keep doing that um yeah so essentially just to play the devil's advocate a little bit, uh, when it comes to dance films, does it take away from that performative immediacy that you get through the, is that uh, something that might undermine the performative nature of the dance itself? That it allows you to do a lot of different things with the, with the film medium. It's a very different approach, uh, Sapna. These two are very different, performing on stage and performing uh, for the... You can do a 30-minute piece. Uh, you can record it within a span of 24 hours or even more, <laughs> right? Uh, right? But you can't afford that kind of uh, you know, convenience or comfort when you're performing on stage. You better be practiced then. You better have your body and mind uh, and spirit in control. Yeah. Elena? Definitely that. live performance is different. Live performance is more like life. <laughs> it just happens. And uh, it's so charged, both for the audience and the, the artist. There are vibrations that you cannot feel uh, through the screen. Uh, as Devika said, you can perform a piece of 20 minutes over 24 hours, or you can uh, refilm it if you have made a mistake. So you can, you can cheat, right? Um, live performance is you're basically uh, naked with your soul and that's what makes it so powerful and transformative but that doesn't mean that a different medium um, doesn't have its own um, advantages and benefits um, mm. so yes I think we all want to go back to both teaching and learning live mm. and performing um, yeah but Everything is good, yeah, yeah. what the purpose and, is. And, uh, and the advent of dance films is no is in no way making live performances irrelevant or... Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, ideally, I think the audience, audience is such an important part of our, yes. uh, the, 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 the physical presence of our audience. There is, I realized over the, you know, over the course of this pandemic that actually you do communicate, even if you don't see them, if you, the house lights are off, there is a communication with the audience in such a different way. You're also uh, in a way projecting a lot of, uh, you know, your life into your work at a particular point in time and space. And even that is so important, that time and space and what you are at that particular point of time uh, and your interaction with the audience then. And that is a very different, uh, it's a very different scenario altogether. I have something I would like to add. Um, yes. Yeah, I think the challenge is going to be how not to use the camera just as a documentation. So again, Devika was kind of mentioning that, how to really push that artistically and uh, transform our art forms into something different because there is another dancer in the, in the question. So how do you dance with that camera so that the product is not just... Uh, I think we really have the opportunity to, to dynamically uh, move our art forward if we use the camera in an intelligent way. It's not easy. Um, you need probably help. You need someone um, that can look through the, you know, through the camera and uh, contribute. Um, but how can we envision envision our dance form in a different way if the camera comes in or one more more than one camera yeah. i think this would be a nice point to show a, a two minute clip of devika's uh, dance film that was uh, sarpatatum we can uh, i'll try to play it Do 
பாம்பே கண்ணை செவியாக கொண்டாய் கண்ணை செவியாக கொண்டாய் கண்ணை செவியாக When presenting Indian dance to an audience that knows nothing about Indian dance or Indian culture, how would you compose a performance which takes precedence, uh, non-narrative dance or Abhinay? Sure. Yeah, and this again depends on the audience. Uh, but in the UK, let's say there is a um, I, I wouldn't general, generalize, but anyway, there is a belief that if the audience is not familiar, you present a pure dance item because they don't have to understand. Again, uh, they just enjoy the, the the beauty of the movement. I maybe because I am a love abhinaya. I love storytelling and I think that's such a power in our dance form to communicate emotions and uh, characters and, uh, you know, psychological states and physical states. Um, again, depending on the audience, I do like uh, to present Abhinaya and, and storytelling. Um, yeah, so I, 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 there is no like a black and white question answer again. Uh, it depends, but I do make a strong case for Abhinaya. Yeah. Often uh, producers and actually programmers, better than producers, uh, ask me to, to dance, um, pure dance, because the audience will not understand. Odissi Abhinaya yeah, is also quite intricate um, with lots of nuances. It's really, really difficult actually as an audience if you really want to understand in terms of how we understand as dancers. But if you want to understand the emotion, um, then you can do that for sure, or if you want to connect with the emotion of the piece. Mm. Devika, do you have uh, any thoughts on that? I would do a combination of both. I would do a combination of both. I would ensure I compile a piece which has pure dance and and do uh, a, an abhinaya portion of something very simple, a very simple content that they can immediately relate to but then like I said how I would expand the scope of Abhinaya for that limited content and I think that way uh, the art form of Mohaniyatam really gives you uh, space to do that because it's it's also slow paced uh, it's very easy to even emote uh, or, or one particular one particular gesture itself can take maybe five minutes to emote and that gets into the imagination of the audience also so yeah, I would do a combination of both. Yeah. And ultimately it depends on the artistry, the artist in herself to connect. I just wanted to make a comment about time. Um, yes. Because, um, I mean, this is, there is this preoccupation and it's understandable of how long it takes yes. to take an idea. But um, I think sometimes the audience has lost the sense of losing time when they are watching a performance really mm -hmm. immersed um, rather than, you know, thinking. Probably that happens if the performer is so strong that 
you know, you just get lost. Not everybody has that power. Uh, but also it's about us trying to shift people's perspective of what is time. When you come for a performance, you're not thinking, of, you should not think about time. It should be really more immersive. Um, immersive doesn't mean that you have maybe have to watch for, you know, full attention for uh, two hours. You know, in India, when they have these uh, two, three days long performances, it's not that they are sitting and watching the whole time. They're getting up, they're eating, they're sitting. So there is such a de different way of perceiving the time of the performance. Um, and I just wonder if there is some kind of potential there for us in the way we can uh, portray our art form. Difficult because uh, especially if you're talking about video, you're talking about maybe, um, maybe condensed in time. Um, yeah, something to think about, I guess. Uh, so another question that we just got. So regional dancers who are very good are not necessarily good at marketing themselves. And festivals will invite those who are good at getting noticed. What can we do about that? You, you want me to answer that? Sure, if you would like to go ahead. I don't know if that's, uh, <laughs> I find that question very funny though. <laughs> Uh, festivals, number one, I don't think they would, uh, uh, I think most of the festivals wouldn't make the mistake of calling somebody who's not good. I mean, uh, uh, you know, if they've proved themselves and if there is, see, finally, it's also about sponsors and audience, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure festivals are not, uh, you know, foolish enough to call people who are not good. I'm sure they would. Uh, look into their and now it's easy because you just need to get into you know get into get online and look at some previous work of the artist it's not even like before so uh, regional dancers I would say some don't know the art of uh, some don't know the art of pushing their work I'm not saying pushing self you know most mm. of the time here in Kerala they have an issue of public relations being negative why should public relations be negative you mm. know uh, you can always uh, push your work. If you if you can't push your work, then there's no point. Uh, there's no point doing it within the confines of your own house. So you have to, and organizers really facilitate that, right? So um, I, I would also say that regional dancers be uh, we we are to be also taught uh, that you know without without uh, being devious or without. Uh, snatching away performances from somebody else. I mean, they don't do that anymore. So I think this is an, a very archaic way of thinking. I don't think it's true anymore. Yeah, mm -hmm. for me, I'll give, you, I'll give you my example. I have curated a festival here called Nishagandhi Dance Festival, which is a government festival. And uh, uh, I was the festival uh, curator and I have had a problem with the government wanting film stars. <laughs> <laughs> to perform. Yes. Yes. So this happens mostly only in Kerala or with the, in the, within the Keralaite community. I don't think it happens anywhere in India or anywhere in the world. It mm -hmm. may happen somewhere in the world where there's a Kerala community again. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be a Kerala So, <laughs> so yeah. uh, their flair for, their flair for film, uh, you know, for dancers who are established film stars. I'm not saying they're bad, but I'm mm. saying uh, you know, there are categories there also. So there is an established hierarchy, I'm sure, in terms of audience perception, in terms of, and uh, to get a break is, is a problem. But once you get it, I think, mm. uh, you know, it's not going to be that difficult. And today, there are so many ways in which you can actually uh, promote yourself without anybody's help online, right? Yes. So, Okay, so another question. Dancers engage in lengthy verbal explanations about the dance when dancing before a non-native audience. What are your thoughts on this practice? Do you do it yourself? Um, I think I kind of, I think already addressed this. Um, how do we tell, but we don't tell too much and who is the mm. audience? 
I mean, sometimes I dance, you know, if for children. I mean, in the in the UK, the performance setting is I, I am assuming also in in states. Um, are quite different sometimes from India. In India, you can get a lot of high quality, you can get a stage. Maybe you don't have perfect lighting as here, but you actually get a stage. Here in the UK, it's quite difficult to get a stage. Huh? You, you, I mean, yeah. So sometimes I'm performing for children or for families, and it's a, you know that kind of audience. So how do you tell them the story is different um, from other people. Or sometimes I'm performing for an academic, audience I've done this when I was doing my PhD so what kind of information you give them that can tease their imagination so you I guess you adjust to the audience um, but too lengthy loses the magic um, loses the magic so, yeah. and also because our pieces are not really like storytelling they are scenes often and they are they provide images so how do you as an artist provide hooks so that audience can see that for a second and then maybe mm. it appears without trying without trying to do gesture by gesture what you're doing then it's difficult because some of our uh, traditional items are not focusing on um, i mean they do have images but they are so intricate i find odyssey especially abinaya is quite intricate in that sense there's a constant shifting many many gestures uh, constant change of character Sometimes um, it's more, more challenging. Yeah, I wanted. To, I don't know if there is. Uh, do you want? Sorry, Devika. Did you want to add something on this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I uh, sometimes it it really is based upon your audience because when I travel for Spikmak also even within India, you've had. I've danced in labor camps. I've danced in. Uh, um, you know, in soldier camps, I've danced in schools, kindergarten schools, old age homes. So ideally, you would choose uh, your uh, your 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 sequence according to what your audience is, and also it's just you at the moment what tells you. Okay, do I need to go into an articulate, <laughs> you know, a more in depth? explanation of that or do I just need to stick to the basics you will know when you're talking with the audience if they sound bored if they look begin start looking bored then you can change and if they you know but like I said because if avoid doing long stories you know avoid doing la stories that need a lot of explanation do short things and explain them and do you need not show the mudras but you can it's good to explain the story otherwise they would not know anything yeah that's that's something that you can do explain the background but you needn't show the mudras as such yeah you can choose to if you think it is okay so in the interest of time uh elena there was something that you were trying to say i do have a couple more questions which we need to no, go ahead um otherwise i was going to briefly talk about my new work Yes, that's one of the questions that I have for you. That is coming from a different, different cultural context. How have you been able to adapt that background into your I think the answer is yes, it is different, but it's also very similar. I never felt, I mean, it is different in terms of I don't understand Oriya, I don't understand Sanskrit, I don't understand Hindi. I try to learn and also because, I mean, as an adult, there is a limit how much you can learn because there is so much work you have to do anyway. Um, so, but it's about the anthropological thing, right? We are all different, but at the end of the day, ultimately, there is a connection. And if that clicks with you. Um, it's very simple in a way. It is difficult because, you know, the technicalities and the understanding of a piece, but at the same time you connect. It's like when you connect with a piece of classical, you, do, you say you don't need to be uh, German to, to like romantic classical music, you just connect, right? Because it's just, it just clicks something. So, um, but for me, in terms of introducing the piece I have, choreographed and I was going to say I'm quite new to choreography although I have done different work choreography within the Odyssey rooted in Odyssey and um, for instance one thing that brought me to Indian classical dance in Odyssey is these archetypes mythology I have grown up with classical Greek mythology this has been part of my, my imagery 
so it's quite easy to, to marry the two things and trying to understand one thing to the other. So this piece I have created is focused on the figure of Ariadne, who is the heroine of the Greek mythology. And um, she's very different from Radha, but at the same time, I have used Radha to illuminate um, the figure of Ariadne. So the piece um, is about uh, being abandoned on the island by the prince Theseus, whom she has helped kill the Minotaur. And there is a lot of stories around that. But I was really focusing on the her experience of being abandoned and that, what does it feel to be abandoned. One point I wanted to make is that unlike Guruji, Guru Kelucian choreographies, again, Abina, is Abina is very intricate and kind of tap into different moment in time, right? We call it um, Sanchari Bhavas. Um, my objective was to immerse myself in the story and to let the audience immerse. So the piece is very much focused on the character. So it's closer to a more uh, verbal storytelling, I would say, than a traditional uh, piece where you go back and forth in time and different moment. Um, yeah, so it's more linear in a way. Maybe it's not from the audience, it is from my <laughs> point of view. So maybe if there is time, I will show um, clip. Or sure, the yeah. I can try to make you the host so that you are able to, let's see if that works. Are you able to share your screen? You are the host now. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is the first scene when she wakes up in the, in the, um, um, in the forest, she's been abandoned on the island. Oops, I should have optimized sound. I don't think there is much time to share more, so I'll just stop here. <clears throat> just share this. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, I have uh, another question, uh, probably our last question. So, uh, coming from the wider global perspective to back to regional, you know, sometimes um, a dance form can become the face of a culture, so intimately linked with it. And in some cases, not even the form, just the appearance of the form, you know, the costume, the head becomes such uh, uh, intimately linked with the culture of cultural identity that it re represents. Is it not, uh, is this stifling for the form itself? Or how do you look at this, uh, um, you know, situation and how does it affect the form itself? I don't know if you can. Yes, meet David. All right. So uh, when we talk about regionalism, I think it is also about we must know that uh, something that originates uh, regionalism is not about something originating from a certain place. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, we in Mohaniyatam we talk about regional rhythms. You know, there's a lot of conversation about regional rhythms and primitive rhythms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, if you look at it, a lot of thing, a lot of it had been brought into Kerala sometime during the 14th, 15th century from the Pratapa Prithvi kings from Karnataka. I mean, earlier on, so into the Pandalam uh, kingdom, uh, many of them. So 
but the fact that it was practiced in that particular place for a long period of time and that it had a lineage of followers it had students and it had generations of practitioners make it make something regional right so now this uh, conflict is definitely the essence of of any art or they you know it's, it's the essence of drama so you, this conflict will happen between <laughs> you know what should remain and what should what should move so you were talking about appearance yes sometimes it can be extremely uh, it it can extremely hinder your work or thought process in the sense that you may want to just use dance just use the medium of the dance form and not uh, not the appearance of it uh, including the head and even if you look at the head do it has gone through its own phases of transition so if you know the history exactly then you wouldn't be uh, you know you wouldn't mind uh, reworking on the costume or even uh, changing it a little bit so uh, but if you have an audience that is new to the art form then i might first do something within the limits of my art form to show that i'm quite sound in my art form and this is i know my basics and i know my tradition but my next work would be different i would rather i would probably jump out of the box <laughs> Uh, elena uh, so you know um, the art form can become a product to be exported you know to within that cultural context uh, also in taking this into context as someone who comes from a different cultural background how does it affect you mm, it's moral it's a moral issue like uh, you at some point you ask yourself what am i doing uh, do i have the right they make you believe when i say they make you i'm i guess i'm referring to mainly people who are linked to those origin they make you believe you will be always an, an outsider and this is new, not your art form and this doesn't really belong to you and then i'm kind of you know it's a long process to reach there but i'm kind of well, this is my body i'm dancing and i'm doing it with passion and i'm investing myself and i love it and i think i do it okay pretty well so i own it the dance doesn't own me yes. so if i own it it's not, it's not a product i'm sharing my love and uh, obviously we live in a in a marketing society we live in a in a society where all transaction are um, i mean they are uh, they, they go through market transaction right and this is not just me there is no guru in india that i don't think there is a guru that is still working with seva or for nothing because we live in a different system so what i'm trying to say is that um we need to have the confidence that comes with you know the inner strength uh, of saying this is you have created this but you also pass it to me and i uh, i have the i'm the, I am in, I have the right mm-hmm. mine and if if I don't do that and because I have for a long time I have felt almost like my body was not mine I was dancing someone else and I, and then I I realized how pernicious is that idea how you feel always uncapable and always incomplete And that's why for me at this moment is not only about representing the culture all do I do it and I do it in an educational context it's about now affirming what the culture also makes to me so I'm not just a vessel for the dance but the dance is also a vessel for me it's a relationship so we are exchanging so that's my view at the moment about this yes david a quickly and then we'll have to wrap up yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll give you an anecdote in the sense that uh, when you when 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 I teach uh, international students, I've had a very <laughs> very amusing experience. I was talking about uh, you know uh, the the concept of uh, the three kinds of heroines, the Nayikas, in one of those in the one of our ancient scriptures, and I was giving them a translated version. I was talking about Uttama Nayika, and then I when I gave the translated version of the Uttama Nayika, I, I was saying the Uttama Nayika is a superior woman. and she's good mannered she smiles always and she is bashful and then i had to stop in between <laughs> because i knew they were eyes looking at me and i said <laughs> okay okay so but we we are all uttama nayikas you know uh, 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 we are all uttama nayikas so don't worry even if you are not bashful we are fine 
and then i moved on to the explain explanation of the the inferior nayika called the adhama and i was and i was saying okay she is inferior she is quarrelsome she engages in useless stuff so this is exactly the the translation and then they stopped me in between and they said we quarrel and we do tinder <laughs> so i said okay yes. but yes. Yeah, certainly not uh, you know mm-hmm. anaika so basically wisdom of yesterday uh, you know it can't be wise today not everything you know if you mm-hmm. use it now it could be otherwise so <laughs> you know certain things really have to stay there and they are just you know they just preserve a moment in history but and and these scriptures are also written by you know by by men or males so seemingly so it has its own version so the this is this is something that happens when you're actually even teaching the art form mm-hmm. there are so many terminologies that need to change right um uh, if, if for example all our all the shastras most of them have kashmir or, or origins but how many mm-hmm. people do in the classical that so it's as simple as that so these all these scriptures have come down and it's the southern you know we we have a lot of southern classical dance so um right now when you present uh, the art form and its underlying sciences and theories you've got to be really careful so we have come to the end of an hour so we have to wrap up now um uh, yes i w- i would like to thank both dr mithil devika and dr elena catalano for an in- insightful and stimulating conversation i'm sure we'll take up a- take away points that we will continue to reflect on Uh, and to all of our viewers on behalf of Somewhat Boston thank you for watching us thank you for asking questions and please like our facebook page and follow our somewhat boston youtube channel so we can continue to bring to you interesting conversations on matters that are regarding indian dance and music would devika is there anything that you would like to say and i would like to thank somwad i would like to thank uh, ms maji and priyadi for having uh, got me here for the conversation and i would also like to thank edina for participating in this uh, thank you so much sir yes same here thank you everyone for inviting us and for engaging in this very thought provoking conversation which i'm sure will let us thinking for a long time ahead thank you thank you so thank you again and stay safe